How about them Buffalo Bills? We're breaking down the Bills' big win over the Dallas Cowboys today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate you all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Happy Victory Monday to you. The Buffalo Bills defeated the Dallas Cowboys 31 to 10 and improved to 8-6 and six on the season. It was a massive step in the Bills' playoff aspirations and one of the funnest Bills games that I've watched in a while. The Buffalo Bills were physically dominant. They set the tone in this game, and Dallas never came close to matching the Bills' physicality. And whether it was the offensive line and tight ends creating holes in the run game or the running backs finishing runs on offense and racking up a bunch of yards or the defense flying around, getting off blocks, making physical tackles, the Buffalo Bills were the physically dominant team. And so we'll talk all about the standout performances But this was about the Buffalo Bills setting the tone physically and the Dallas Cowboys not being able to come close to matching it for 60 minutes. I want to talk about this game through a different lens. I sometimes do things I like, things I didn't like. I want to talk about just different dynamics of this game because obviously it was a dominant win. There's a lot to be excited about. And so I think kind of just talking about it, Generally, while getting into the highs and lows of each department, I think is going to be our best our best path forward to cover this game. But we do have to start with James Cook. I mean, have a day, Jimbo. 25 rushes for 179 yards and a touchdown. Two catches for 42 yards and a touchdown. He totals 27 touches in the game, 221 yards from scrimmage, and two touchdowns. James Cook is becoming a superstar right before our eyes. And it was a big talking point, at least for me on this podcast, in terms of him stepping into this role, Devin Singletary having led the Bills in rushing each of the last four seasons. What does that transition look like? And you know what type of ability does he have in a big-time role? I mean, he he was never the featured back at Georgia. And now he's the guy for the Bills, and my goodness, he's having a sensational season. He's becoming a superstar. We talked last week about if James Cook is a pro bowler. Well, I think he put the exclamation point on that conversation with what he did against the Dallas Cowboys. In all likelihood, James Cook comes out of week 15, number two behind only Christian McCaffrey in scrimmage yards among running backs in the entire NFL and probably top five for all skill players. He was masterful in this game. He did a great job of finding daylight, slipping off tackles, being elusive, and really just being the engine, being the catalyst for the Buffalo Bills. I mean, he should be the AFC Offensive Player of the Week, and it's nice to know that you could score 31 points against a good team and not lean on Josh Allen to carry the operation. James Cook was that guy today. And he was sensational. Have a few more comments about him in just a moment. But James James Cook, the story in this game. 
which you have to mention the entire run game, though. I mean, the offensive line was phenomenal in this football game. The run game in general was phenomenal, even when James Cook wasn't the one carrying the ball. Ty Johnson was really solid in this game. Nine carries for 54 yards. Josh Allen and Latavius Murray both had rushing touchdowns. I mean, in, including three Kyle Allen kneel downs, you had 49 rushes for 266 yards. That's over five yards per carry and three rushing touchdowns. It was a spectacular day for the Bills offensive line and the ball carriers. The consistency of creating space by the offensive line was terrific. Whether they ran inside, outside, weak side, strong side, bunch sets, zone, gap, whatever they wanted to do, they did it. Give a lot of credit to, of course, the execution by the players. But how about Aaron Cromer and what he's done with his offensive line in year two? We've often wondered, right, like, what would the Bills look like if they had a consistent offensive line and a run game? Well, there's your answer. And so just the unit as a whole played spectacular. I thought the tackles in particular were really good. Spencer Brown and Deion Dawkins. I mean, Deion Dawkins is burying dudes all over the field. I know that it was the the one play where he's driving his dude like 20 yards down the field, but like that was him all game. And I've been talking up Deion Dawkins all season long, saying he's having the best season of his career. And I think people are finally understanding the how high of a level he's playing at this season. I thought Connor McGovern did some really good things in the run game. Osiris Torrance, I thought the tight ends were both, you know, whether it was Q Morris or uh, Dalton Kincaid or Dawson Knox, they, Dawson Knox in particular, really good job of run blocking in this game. And I thought Joe Brady really was phenomenal at mi mixing and matching personnel. I mean, just a lot of different groups of players together, a lot of, you know, two back stuff, two tight end stuff. It was just a lot of variety, and I think Dallas saw a lot of unscouted looks and unscouted personnel groupings and didn't have an answer. So obviously, this Bill's rushing offense, James Cook, the offensive line, everything that goes into the execution, the coaching, all of it was phenomenal in this football game. I want to talk a little bit about Josh Allen in the passing game. Obviously not a huge statistical day for Josh Allen. He only threw the ball 15 times, 7 of 15, 94 yards and a touchdown. I mean, that's like first quarter stats typically for Josh Allen. That was his entire game, and the Bills scored 31 points, one by three touchdowns. Obviously a couple of really fun passing plays, one being James Cook, the touchdown pass to him. The throw on the move to Stefan Diggs where, I mean, Steph reaches out with the left hand and pulls it in. Crazy good play. A couple of really fun plays, but this really wasn't about Josh Allen, you know, throwing the ball all over the yard. That wasn't what this game script called for. But one thing that I do want to point out is that you still had a lot of missed opportunities in the passing game, and that, that has become a consistent takeaway of mine recently when studying the Bills' offense, and that's not different against Dallas. You know, Gabe Davis, no catches for the fourth time in the last six games. And the play there for Gabe was the it was the second and three. Josh threw the ball down the field, way down the field for Gabe Davis. And like Gabe couldn't find it. He couldn't try to make a play on the ball. Then you have Stefan Diggs had a chance on the next play, the very next play, to come up with a catch on a third down early in the game. And he couldn't make the play. He had two Dalton Kincaid drops. And I know, like, there was a storyline in the game. Greg Olson showed us that he switched his gloves and, you know, he was using like a leathery glove that doesn't really work if it's not wet. And it wasn't wet at that point. He switched gloves and then he didn't get another target the rest of the game, but he dropped both of his targets. And then James Cook drops a touchdown pass. You know, it's hard to like poke holes in a dominant performance, but that's what I do. I evaluate things and, this has been a theme here where the Bills in the passing game, just a lot of missed opportunities. Josh Allen against seven of 15, eight incompletions. And I just talked about five of them being, you know, drops, missed opportunities, couldn't make a play on the ball. And they're leaving a lot of production out there once again in the passing game. And so, look, I, I just, I want it to be better. I want to see 
this passing game firing on all cylinders, right? The run game's doing well. The defense has been phenomenal over the last couple of weeks. All right, let's be able to throw the ball too, right? I think that's a, an important component to clean up here as the Bills gear up for the last three games of the regular season. All right, we're going to tie a ribbon on the offense, talk defense here in just a moment, so be sure to stick with us. But when you're hiring for your small business, you want to be sure that you have as many top-tier candidates available as possible to interview. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the very best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates, so easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and may not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy, and they also even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, folks, let's tie a ribbon on this offensive performance here. 31 points, 28 first downs. You're five of nine converting on third downs. That's above 50%. That's a great place to be. 351 total yards. And look, Kyle Allen came in with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, right? You, I mean, you did that in three quarters of play. 266 rushing yards. You're three of four scoring touchdowns in the red zone, so 75% there. You possessed the ball for over 35 minutes, and these scoring drives were phenomenal. I mean, these weren't like – it wasn't like the Bills had a bunch of short fields or had a bunch of takeaways that – led to a bunch of points or had the special teams touchdowns or defensive touchdowns. These were legit scoring drives, five scoring drives, 12 plays, 75 yards, 11 plays, 86 yards, 11 plays, 75 yards, 15 plays, 65 yards and six plays, 67 yards. I mean, you did what you wanted scoring points in this game couple of shout outs here that I want to give Josh Allen. The interception streak is over. So that's great. I know he had some unluck, unlucky moments there, but the, the interception streak is over. Uh, Josh Allen also set a new NFL record with 10 games in a single season with both a rushing and passing touchdown. That's the most ever in the history of the NFL. Also, James Cook, a couple of shout outs here. James Cook's 221 yards from scrimmage, most for a Bills player since Fred Jackson in 2009. This is also his fifth straight game with over 100 yards from scrimmage, which is the most by a Bill since 2016 when Shady McCoy did it. It's also the third most uh, amount of yards, the 221 yards from scrimmage, the third most by any player in the NFL this season. So just a really fun day offensively, particularly for the Bills rushing offense. And then, of course, Jane, uh, Josh Allen with a pretty notable milestone here. All right, let's talk defense here. And it was a heck of a day once again for the Bills defense. Uh, consecutive games now. Uh, two big back-to-back -back wins. Coming out of the bye, you beat Kansas City and Dallas. You go into Arrowhead and beat the Chiefs. Come home and beat Dallas. Terrific response after imploding against the Philadelphia Eagles. So now all of a sudden you've won three of your last four with consecutive wins over the Chiefs and Dallas Cowboys where you held Dallas and Kansas City to a combined 27 points. And particularly against Dallas, I mean, you limited a good, hot Dallas Cowboys offense. You know, we, we talked about the five-game win streak for Dallas entering this game where they were averaging over 40 points per game. The number one scoring offense in the NFL entering the game, you held them to 10 points, their lowest total of the season. And that includes, that 10 points includes a garbage time touchdown with two minutes and 48 seconds left in a ball game. You limited them to 14 first downs. They were 5 of 13 on third downs. 5 of 13, that's 38%. And this was the number one third down team in the NFL entering the game. You held them to 195 total yards, under 200 yards. The lowest they've had all season long. And keeping in mind that 80 
of the 195 total yards came on that late garbage time touchdown drive. I mean, just a phenomenal job by the defense. Dak Prescott, potential NFL MVP, goes 21 of 134 yards with an interception and didn't have a passing touchdown. 2.9 yards per pass play. 2.9. That's not good rushing production, much less passing. 3.94 yards per attempt. Red zone defense was really good. Uh, they had a big stop. I know the Bills won the game by a lot, but that red zone stop early early in the game was, was to me, a big moment. You're leading 14 to nothing. They wind up having it second and one at the 11, threatening to score. Taylor Rapp with a big tackle for loss. And then on third down, Ed Oliver tips a pass to force a field goal. Instead of it being 14 to seven and them scoring a touchdown, it's 14 to three. That was a big deal. I, you know, you never know like those types of things, how it affects the entire flow of a game. And the Bills getting that early red zone stop, I think, was really important in this game. You got an interception this game. Dak doesn't really throw interceptions, right? Only six of them this season entering the game. Christian Benford comes away with the pick. And you had four chances at an interception prior. That Christian Benford early in the game hit him right in the chest. He didn't catch it. Then Jordan Phillips had a chance on that Ed Oliver tip pass. He couldn't catch it. Taron Johnson was breaking towards the sideline, had a chance to pick one off. And Jordan Poyer... On that throw in the middle of the field, he had a chance to pick it off. So Dak, for a guy that only threw an interception on 1.3% of his passing attempts entering this game, gave you some legit chances to to pick it off, and you did. You you did get one. He had three sacks on defense. Leonard Floyd, shout out to him. He's up to 10.5 sacks on the season. He's the first Bills player with double-digit sacks since Lorenzo Alexander in 2016. And he gets a $1 million bonus in incentives for getting double-digit sacks. So, heck of a signing there for, for Brandon Bean. Jordan Phillips had a sack. I repeat, Jordan Phillips had a sack. He did something positive to help the Buffalo Bills. Let's throw a parade. It was nice to see. And then Dotson and uh, Tyrell Dotson and Greg Rousseau combined for a sack. So, three sacks in this ball game, seven quarterback hits, seven pass breakups. The Bills did a really good job of competing at the catch point. No catches were easy for them, and it was just a bunch of different players just making things tough, restricting the catch point. It was a great job. I thought the Bills' defense tackled extremely well in this game, which is not something I typically feel like, but this is one of their best tackling games I've seen under Sean McDermott. And I thought, I mean, just McDermott's in his bag right now, calling the defense with what he's done these last two weeks against the Chiefs and Cowboys. Keep it up. Keep it up. Uh, real quick on special teams, Tyler Bass, 4 of 4 on extra points, was 1 of 1 on field goals, so a perfect day for, for Tyler Bass, which you need those. I thought Sam Martin was really solid in this game, not like elite or anything like that, but I thought his punts were, were good. Um, he did have two near-blocked punts early in the game. The first two punts were near-blocked, and I, that's something that Matthew Smiley's got to investigate a little bit. What did Dallas see? in the Bills' punt formation that had them close to blocking a couple of punts. So that was definitely a low light in this game. I thought Deontay Hardy did a good job returning punts. And I think the Bills did a good job in terms of kickoff coverage where they actually gave Kevontae Turbin, uh, Dallas's returner, a couple of chances to return the ball. He's one of the best in the game. And both of those times, the Bills tackled him Inside the 25, I think one was at the 18 and one was somewhere around the 20. So a couple of a couple of nice jobs of getting down the field and, and tackling a dangerous return man um, when, you know, a fair catch or a touchback gets it at the 25. And so that was good to see. Um, but the special teams side of things, that you got to investigate those two near punt blocks and understand, like, it, late in the season, it feels like, Every year, there's this uptick in blocked field goals and blocked punts. And I think it's because at that point in the year, there's so much tape out there that teams can really dig into and see, all right, where are they a little bit soft? Where's their opportunities to make some plays? And you see it happen later in the season. And so I need Matthew Smiley to spend a little time here figuring this out to make sure that we don't have a big miscue on special teams with a blocked punt or a blocked field goal. 
uh, that's going to you know cost this team a football game. But heck of a job defensively for Sean McDermott's unit. Uh, really shut down a good NFL offense, and it's nice to see that unit playing with some swagger and with some moment, momentum here as the Bills have a real opportunity to go on a run. And they're they're on a run. They're two games into this run, and it's it's so far so good. We're going to talk about that big picture here in just a moment. So definitely stick with us. But folks, as the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. And right now, new customers can get one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet. That's right, a hundred and fifty bucks if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app. Super easy to use, and there's a ton of different things that you can bet on, including the spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. You know we hit on that James Cook over for receiving yards. I think they had it at 23 and a half. I told you to smash the over. The over hit, and we're probably going to ride that for a while here until they put those numbers a little bit higher. Uh, so, it, you know, that's where I've been having fun is on the player props. So check it out. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. We all like to play fantasy football, but there's always that one annoying guy in the league that you just can't stand. He's the guy that you have to beat no matter what. He's always talking about how good his trades are and bringing up analytics. You know the guy I'm talking about? Well, let's just call him Alec. Every league has an Alec. But you know what Alec does? He also brings weak tortilla chips to a tailgate, the kind that snap right in half when you're scooping guacamole or you're trying to get that last scoop of salsa. For someone who claims to be the master of trades, he still hasn't made the trade for a better tortilla chip. You see, at Zach's Mighty, we believe in two things. One, chips are meant to be sturdy. And two, Alec doesn't know the difference between a strong chip and a wet paper towel. Our chips are cut from whole tortillas the authentic way to give them the strength to lift the heftiest dips and are fried to a corny crisp suitable for any dip at any tailgate. So this football season, don't be an Alec and choose Zach's Mighty Tortilla Chips, available at Wegmans at all locations. Be a winner. Eat Zach's Mighty Tortilla Chips. All right, folks, let's examine the big picture here and and recap my predictions and talk about what's next. The big picture is that the Bills are now 8-6. and They're number two in the AFC East behind the Dolphins that are 10-4. and Couldn't get any help from the Jets. That game was interesting for about five seconds. They're number nine in the AFC, so they're up from number 11. So they they made up a little bit of ground here. And the AFC, as of the recording of this podcast, the six through nine seeds are all eight and six. So it's a log jam there, and the Bills are not in good shape when it comes to tiebreakers because they lost to the Broncos, they lost to the Bengals, and they are four and five in the AFC. Now they have three AFC games to close things out, and these are going to be important. but. Counting on the wild card is just super annoying, right? Like this week was not fun to watch all the games that you wanted to go a certain way for the Bills. That wasn't fun, right? Like the Vikings blew it in their opportunity to beat the Bengals. The Bears blew it with their chance to beat the Browns. The Titans blew it with their chance to beat the Texans, right? And that was frustrating to watch. So like counting on other teams to do things to help you is just annoying. And obviously the Jets didn't have a pulse against Miami. Now, you got a little help. You didn't get a little help. You got a lot of help with the Lions beating the Broncos. And it was good to see the Colts and Steelers play because that means somebody lost. And so that got a team their seventh loss, which was important. But I'm focused on the division right now. I think the path to the division is much more straightforward. You know, I think there's going to be some... There's going to be some challenging dynamics in that wild card race because you you blew conference games and you don't have the head to head against Cincinnati or Denver. That's going to cost you. Your path to the division is much more straightforward. We've talked about it already. And with week 15 now behind us, there's three games to play. If the Bills go out and beat the Chargers and Patriots the next two weeks, and Miami loses one of their next two, just one, Dallas next week, or at Baltimore. The following week, if they lose one of those games, that means week 18 is for all the marbles. Bills versus Dolphins week 18 decides the division. As long as the Bills beat the Chargers and Patriots and the Dolphins lose one of their games against the Cowboys 
or Ravens. So now we become huge Cowboys fans. So thanks for everything, Dallas. Now we need you to do the opposite, play really well and beat Dallas. And the Bills are going to be in position for a game in week 18 that will decide the AFC East. You dug yourself a big hole, but you have a chance to get out of it. And if you get in the dance, you are the team that nobody wants to play. So win your games. And you have your, I mean, if the Bills win out, they're they're going to go to the playoffs. They're going to be eleven and six. They're going to go to the playoffs. If you get one Dolphins loss against the Baltimore Ravens or Dallas Cowboys, and you beat them in Week 18, you win the AFC East for a fourth consecutive year in a row. Let's look at my predictions here. I did pretty good here, um, but there's one that bothers me. Uh, number one, my first prediction was that the Bills would hold Dallas under 30 points. I could, I probably could have been more aggressive there, right? They held them to 10, 10 points. They had been averaging 40.2 games, uh, 40.2 points per game over their last five, with 33 being the low. Well, they only got the 10 against the Bills. So I got that one right. I predicted that Dak Prescott would throw an interception. Keeping in mind, he only threw one in the last six games, none in the last four. The Bills have not necessarily been picking off passes left and right, well, it happened. And he probably should have thrown a few picks, but the bottom line is he threw one, and I predicted that he would throw one, so I got that one correct. Here's the one I missed. I predicted Stefan Diggs over 66 and a half receiving yards. That didn't happen. He got 48, and obviously the game script, you know, they only threw the ball 15 times, so uh, wasn't a lot of opportunity out there in the passing game. Didn't need there to be, but I missed that prediction hoping for a big game for Steph against the Chargers. I want to see him really get rolling here over these last three games before the Bills get into the postseason, hopefully. I uh, I had the over on James Cook receiving yards. FanDuel had it at 22 and a half, 42. Uh, so we got that. And remember, I told you Dallas was the defense in the NFL that has allowed the second fewest receptions to running backs this season. And then I predicted a Bills win, and that happened. And there were some people that were a little surprised that I picked the Bills to beat the Cowboys. I felt pretty good about this game. I, I knew that Dallas was a good team. I have respect for Dallas. There's no doubt about that. But I just felt like they're a team that always kind of has these letdowns, right? They had their big win at home against Philadelphia. You just felt like the hype train was there. And they came in fat and happy. And the Bills blew them out. And I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't sure it was going to be a blowout, but I felt like the Bills were going to win this game. And they did. And now, like, that was the big hurdle. The, the big hurdle in these this three-game stretch of Dallas, Chargers, Patriots, you cleared the big one. Now, I, I'm i very mindful of the challenge ahead next week going to, to Los Angeles to play the Chargers. I, not that the Chargers are a great team. Obviously, they just gave up 63 points to the Raiders. They fired their coach. They fired their GM. They're, they're a team that's very much in shambles. Justin Herbert is hurt. We'll see what happens with Keenan Allen this week. But the bottom line is they're a team that played on Thursday. They got embarrassed. They fired their coach. And so now they have extended rest against the Bills, who are on a short week going across the country to play in Los Angeles. Now, go win the game. Like, I don't care about any of that. But those are real dynamics for this game that makes it a little bit more challenging. And teams typically get a little bit of a one-game bump when they fire their coach. It just kind of happens. And I don't think Brandon Staley was loved by that team. I mean, how many games did he cost the Chargers over the last two and a half years? A lot. I'm sure they're going to be fired up to play behind this new coach, right? So they're, it's going to be a spirited effort by them. Out, you Go win the game. But it's definitely, there's some dynamics here that make it more challenging than, oh, wow, you're playing the, the Chargers after they gave up 63 points. They don't have their starting quarterback and they just fired their coach. Well, yeah, that's kind of what makes it tough, right? I hope that makes sense to you. So, obviously, we're spent a lot of time this week focused on getting ready for that one, a Saturday game. Uh, so, our, our programming this week might be a little bit different, but I can promise you our next conversation is the All-22 Review. Uh, that'll drop probably sometime Monday, early evening. I'll spend all day Monday in the tape. If you're part of our subtext community, which I fully recommend you being part of, uh, you'll be in our Discord channel, which means you'll see all the All-22 film clips, and you know what I'm going to spend time on, this run game. And I want to focus in on kind of what made the defense so, so successful as well against a very good Cowboys offense. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. I would love for you to join the subtext community. There's a link in today's show notes to be part of that. 
And then, of course, you get in our Discord channel, which is super fun. So check all of that out and uh, make sure that you are subscribed. Don't miss anything here. It's going to be a fun close to this season. We're going to talk about everything, every step of the way. So make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Go Bills. Enjoy your victory Monday. And I look forward to catching up with you again for the All-22 Review.